and and market value is a is a pretty long uh, definition. But the the most pertinent parts of the definition of market value are that it's the most probable price, and it's between uh, two parties that are uh, under no no uh, duress to sell. They have no reason to have to sell or no reason to have to buy. These are uh, willing buyer, willing seller, and the most probable price. So now, we have that. We have to define the market value for the property. And then real property tax law 102 subsection 12 includes in the definition of real property, and obviously I've just snipped out of there, buildings and other uh, articles and structures, substructures, superstructures erected upon, under, or above the land, or affixed thereto, and this would include plumbing, heating, lighting, and power generating apparatus. So I think you can see fairly readily from that that the, the solar systems that we're talking about here do fall under the definition of real property, under real property tax 102.12. And so, therefore, they do go into the calculation of market value. Within solar, um, there, there are various categories. Um, and some of you here may know more about some of the intricacies of some of these than I do. Um, but the reality is there, there's two basic categories of solar, right? There's passive solar, and then there's active solar. Now, within the active solar, there are uh, two major types, I would call them. And they are, the first one there is hydronic. And, and basically what we're talking about here is, uh, for lack of a better term, it's a batch preheater of water. Um, and, and these systems people have been using in various degrees of uh, technical, uh, you know, you might think of tubing on a roof. Right? You think of uh, you know, your garden hose laying out on the driveway with water in it. When you go to empty the hose, it's hot. That's what we're talking about there, hydronic. We're talking about uh, systems that typically would preheat the water, the hot water that's going to be used in the house. Now, this could end up being for domestic hot water, or uh, with, with the newer systems, obviously, it could be for radiant uh, in-floor heat. But the one that we want to focus on, and it's pretty apparent really quickly, the orange on green in a dark room does not work, right? <laughs> so I can't even read what it says. I'm going to have to read it from my screen. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not sure I can read it from the screen without my glasses. Not really. Uh, they may be too strong. Get it the right distance, we'll get this. I swear. You need somebody to hold? Yeah, out in the parking lot. <laughs> Roof, ground, and pole mounted photovoltaic modules which harvest solar energy as DC for on site storage or inversion to AC in grid tide. Okay, so that's the reason I put it in orange is because that was going to be the focus of tonight's deal. <laughs> but anyway, and it is going to be, but that's what we're talking about here. This is usually what people think about when they think about solar, right? You're talking about modules that are placed, you know, however it would be, on a roof, on a pole, or on the ground, um, and they're grid tied. Now, before we go farther, obviously they don't have to be grid tied, but when they're not grid tied, um, they don't have a lot of the government subsidies tied to them, obviously. Makes sense, right? Um, and usually, you will see systems like that in places where there is, no, there is no power currently. There is no utility power. That's usually where you will see them. Um, we don't have a huge call for that around here. In other places, in the Catskills, and certainly in the Adirondacks, you see this. Um, and from my experience, that actually creates a sub-market. There are actually people who are, will buy the properties based on that. You will have a house that is off-grid and has a uh, PV system that's not grid-tied. Obviously, they're off the grid. Um, and there's actually a set of market participants interested in that. So that's, again, even now, we're, we're refining this down to, to the thing that I think is of the most interest to the most people, and that is the grid-tied systems of PV, photovoltaic. 
So now that we're talking about that subset, and remember, I'm gonna, I, I keep going back to this, but this whole thing is talking about solar, farm waste, and wind energy. They're all together. But we're talking specifically about the one that's the most likely to affect the most amount of people here, and that's going to be the PV. So now, uh, the question that faces uh, any assessor, whatever town it might be, and I apologize for the times when I do actually just read off this, but I'm going to hear. How much more would market participants most probably pay for this property now that the alternative energy system has been installed? That's what we call contributory bid. Now that's the same for anything you do with the property. I mean, I will frequently have people contact me and say, you know, I'm going to put up a barn, I'm going to put up a shed, I'm going to put up a garage. How much is my assessment going to go up? That's what it is, contributory value. We're valuing the property before this change. We're valuing the property after the change. That's the contributory value, whatever, whatever that garage, that shed, or in this case, the PV panels, uh, the PV system, how much it adds to, again, the market value of the overall property. So I think that part... That part is pretty important to understand, that it is the contributory value. So if we go right into uh, the three approaches to value, and again, this, this is just standard appraisal stuff. This is done for, doesn't matter what kind of property. I mean, each one of these approaches may be more important in certain types of property, such as obviously a single family residence, the income approach is not that important, um, and the cost approach is not as important as the sales comparison but we still have all three approaches. So now we're gonna take those three approaches and apply it to the PV alternative energy system. The first one is, is probably the easiest one, but it's probably the one that tends to scare people, okay, that have a residence and are worried about, you know, what am I going to do to the assessment? So in the cost approach, we're just going to take the cost to put that system in, and then we're going to make at least three subtractions. We're going to minus physical degradation. And that's big with these. I mean, that's big. Once you get out a few years, that's big. We're going to minus functional obsolescence. And, and where you might think of that is, let's say, five years down the road, they develop new technology which which works so much better more efficiently you can get more electricity now you're stuck with this old panel right so now this old style panel is not going to have the value of a new one just based on technology think of that as the functional obsolescence and then the big thing that the hardest part of this to, to, to do is minus the market reaction so uh, this wasn't meant to be too much of an appraisal <laughs> subject here, but remember that the approaches to value are just that. They're three approaches to get to the same place. They're to get to market value. There's no separate cost value, income value, sales comparison value. We're trying to get to market value, which again we defined uh, very informally, verbally, as the most probable price between uh, two parties. Right? So we're trying to get there, and we're doing it by using the cost approach. So now we have to minus the market's reaction. What are people paying for this property? How much more, again, remember, contributory value, how much more will the participants, will the buyers in this case, pay for this property? The second one is actually the <coughs> easiest one to do and the most reliable. Uh, the income approach to market value, which is, I mean, I stated it very simply here, and it is kind of simple. It's, I mean, it's calculations, but it's pretty simple. It's you're taking the net present value of anticipated energy sales, which, I mean, in most of these cases is not really technically a sale. It's, you know, the savings that you're going to get at your property if we're talking about residential, okay? Talking about residential, um, you're putting this on your roof or you're putting it on a pedestal, that's what we're going to look at in the income approach. What is the, the present value of the energy savings or the payments that are going to be over the holding period? That's a very easy calculation. But again, we have to get it back to market value. And that's really where 
The third approach <coughs> is the most difficult, but it's really the, the most important one. And that is, again, how much more are buyers paying for property based on the inclusion of the alternative energy system? For residential, that is difficult. There's lots of studies, but you will find that <coughs> most of the studies that have been done are you know, for more southern locales than, than we have here in upstate New York, right? So that's really the most important approach, and right now we just don't have enough information to really hang our hat on that, and that's just the way it is. We don't, but in theory, in the sales comparison, again, uh, I don't really want to bore you too much with the details of appraisal theory, but the nice thing in sales comparison would be if you had a subdivision, all the homes were exactly alike, and you had you know 10 sales that had PV panels on the roof and 10 sales that didn't, and you say, wow, okay, so people are paying you know, X number of dollars based on the years for those. That would be uh, that would be really nice. Never going to happen. Okay. Um, now, in some of these studies, it has happened, but most of these studies, again, are going to be Arizona, California. Um, you know, so that's that's going to impact things. That's the three approaches to value. The reason that I put this in here, though, is because if you looked at, you know, the first approach and the first line underneath there, cost to replace the system, if any of you have done this or if you've looked at the prices or, or talked with people that have done this, you, you kind of get a feel for what the cost is. You don't want to equate, especially in a residential setting, you don't want to equate that cost with an increase in market value and therefore assessment and therefore taxes, okay? And one of the big reasons is because the, the government subsidies. That's why somebody is willing to spend the money. In most cases, on a residential project, that's why they're willing to spend the money. It's not because of line, the, the second approach. It's not because of the money coming in unless you put the government subsidies in with that. Then, then, then you can make the numbers work. But without the government subsidies, you can't make the numbers work. It's just the way it is. So the, the only thing I'm suggesting, I guess, from this whole slide is don't, if you're in a residential setting, don't be concerned that if you spend $60,000 on a system, that it's going to increase the value and therefore the assessment to the tune of $60,000, because it's not going to happen, okay? It's, that's, that's the whole statement of that whole slide right there. I know it took 15 minutes to get that, right? So, the last thing, and in my view at this point, the most important, we're stating here that the alternative energy systems may be exempt from municipal property taxes. And what that amounts to is yet another government subsidy. That's what that really is. And of course, obviously by government, I do mean your neighbors, the other taxpayers in the town. Um, so, where does that exemption come from? It comes from Real Property Tax Law 487. And that provides an exemption which covers, again, remember this, all three types, which again are solar, farm waste, wind energy, and for all privately held property. It doesn't make any distinction, that's what it is. That's just the way it is. Now that exemption, along with many others in New York State, are uh, a local what they call a local option. In other words, each taxing district, it's not, the, it's not the assessing district, it's each taxing district, can opt out of this exemption. Uh, I did not update this in the past month, two months, uh, but a couple of months ago, there were six counties, 39 towns, five villages, and many school districts that had already opted out of the exemption. As some of you are aware, I think there was discussion about this, the, uh, the county uh, passed a resolution where they tried <clears throat> to say that they wanted to treat, uh, they wanted to break up this solar category into different categories uh, based on the type of system it is. <clears throat> Number one, they, didn't, they never addressed anything about the fact that this whole exemption, which is authorized by 487, is very clear that it talks about all three types. It talks about solar, farm waste, and wind energy. They, they ignored that part uh, when they made this resolution. 
And then they further took one of those groups and divided it into three groups. Uh, as most of you know, I'm not an attorney, so. Uh, but as an assessor in reading this, I don't really think this is going to hold up in court. And I think, you know, you know, who are the people that have the money to sue? It's going to be the big company that comes in and do, does a project. I mean, that, that's who's, I mean, in any event. Um, the, the, the most egregious part of this resolution to me um, it, is that the county said that somehow the town would be the lead agency in negotiating and ensuring that the pilots are in place. Um, as I mentioned just a sentence ago, litigation. So now the town had nothing to do with the production of this resolution. Um, but now I could foresee us <laughs> being embroiled in uh, trying to defend it. I could even see us being embroiled in having to, to defend against the county, who may not like the way we did it, even though they came up with a resolution. I, 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 as you can tell, I don't really like this resolution. Um, and, and so I just want to tell you, and I will maybe entertain some questions about specifics if you have them, um, but I'm just going to be right up front with everyone here. Um, as far as I can remember, the town board never approached me. I found out about this, and I'm the one who told the town board that I thought that it would be in the best interest of everyone involved in the town of Franklin to opt out of this exemption. Um, it's not, you know, I, I think people with a residential project may be scared about my what I just said, to, to say to opt out so you can't have the exemption. But I think the reality is in a residential setting, the value that's added and therefore the assessment and therefore the taxes is really not going to be that much. Obviously in situations where it's quote unquote a solar farm, where you're taking a piece of vacant land um, and you're harvesting much more than you are. I mean, don't forget that in these residential settings, um, basically the way these are set up is so that over a year's period, you don't uh, sell back more than one month's worth of energy use. Does that make sense to you? In other words, they try to, they try to set the, the, uh, the, the modules up so that you only harvest enough basically of what you would typically use in a year plus or minus a month that you're not you're not like harvesting you know tons of electricity here and they're they're making money off you they're making money off the government subsidy which they're taking when they put that on there and then within two years they're gone you won't even know who owns your uh, you know your solar modules so I guess the thing, I'm trying to anticipate some concern on the part of residential people that taking this exemption away is not going to increase your taxes tremendously, okay? Um, for larger, for larger, again, we call them solar farms, then yes, there is going to be substantial. But again, this is a business that is making money off that property and just like other businesses though we don't look at you know we're not looking at an income or a sales tax we are looking at the value of the buildings the improvements that they're using to run this business they would be taxed so leaving this exemption in place would basically take one type of business and making it exempt hopefully I didn't put too much of my own personal spin on that um, I, I have nothing against solar believe me um, but I think, I think, to me, the thing that absolutely pushed the trigger for me to recommend to the town board to opt out was the reading of the county resolution. I think that's going to be a big problem. Jim? Yes. I know uh, <clears throat> this, uh, this resolution was set up from the tax department and went through the finance committee. And I know I asked the finance committee to put off the vote for two weeks, you know, to get more information about it. Initially, the county did want to, they recommended opting out, was the initial recommendation from the county. And then they went to this, this, this resolution, which um, I did try to 
you know, slow it down a little bit. And I was the only supervisor that voted against it. You know, so it did pass 18 to 1. But, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, between talking with you and just, you know, the simplicity of it, you know, this is what they're allowing you to do instead of making loopholes with this 50, 25, 25, you know, I can see, I can't see the schools accepting it to start with because they're normally getting 60% of the lump or thereabouts. You're going to give them 25. You know, what's what's the incentive for them to say, yeah, this is a good thing, we, we want this. The county's getting basically what they would be getting either way. The town could be benefiting, but that's that's a could be. And I think on this resolution, it also said, doesn't it says pilot in parentheses, I believe, but it has a community um, agreement or something. A, I can't think. Of Solar that. host community Solar benefit host community benefit agreement. Package agreement, which doesn't come up to pilot at all. But you know, uh, then it's I think pilot after that. So it's a type of pilot program or whatever. So uh, it's, you know, between talking with you and, you know, I, I haven't felt good about it, and I, think, I don't think the board has felt good about it either. But I, I appreciate you coming, but I wanted to let, you know, that I did vote against it. I wanted more time, and they had to push it through. It had to be done. That was all there was to it. Well, I mean, obviously they didn't ask me that, um, the day Delaware County asked me anything would be. <laughs> a bunch of us will be buried. But anyway, um, they didn't ask me anything about it, but I think it's it's pretty it's pretty obvious to me um, that I mean it was a quote unquote rush to judgment. In other words, the the company the solar companies have been mailing these things to taxpayers. So I mean they preemptively want to make sure that uh, you know these people, as you said, the, their initial reaction was the same as mine to opt out. And make sure that you get the tax dollars from the from the wind from the solar farms. Um, but then they got. I, I, I mean, I, I think probably they had good intentions. You know, they didn't want to quote unquote hurt a residential person who was going to do a small project. They didn't want to see them pay more taxes. But I don't think there's really any way around that. Um, I, I really think this is going to open up litigation. And I, you know, I really. <coughs> If somebody's going to be involved, then I'd rather it be the county than the town. But that's obviously the, uh, right, I'm not here to make policy. I'm just giving you my. Right, but you're the one who sets the assessment in a township, not the county. Right, Am and I right it, on that. Yeah, and and, and that's the, the funny thing with 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 any pilot, it, the the way the pilots are, you cannot. They can't pay more than they would have on their assessment. Right. So you still have to come up with the assessment before you can do the pilot anyway, right. and. A person who's subject to a pilot could still come and file a lawsuit on their assessment. Therefore, get the assessment lower, and then therefore the pilot cannot give you as much as it could before if the assessment's lower. So I mean, it's you know I think it's just introducing a, another Jim, layer. Yes. Then. Going back to the whole, like every district has its right to opt out, correct? Right? That's correct. So with any township, you could have the school opt out, and yet have the, which creates a problem within the tax breakup. Of the equation of how the tax format works, right? Oh, absolutely. That was, I mean, that was the. Am I wrong in what I'm thinking oh, no, on that? No, you're 100. percent I mean, and that's the. I, I mean, I hate. Well, I don't hate to say this, but I'm going to say it. That, I don't hate to say it. Let me take that part back. I'll say it anyway. Uh, that's the heavy-handed nature of this county resolution. It's as if they decided all these things, and that's what that's what an opt-out or opt-in is. It's the, the taxing district, the governing body of the taxing district makes that decision. So each of our five school districts in Franklin has to make that decision. The village has to make that decision, the town, and obviously the county, uh, you know, they have to make those decisions. So like you said, once, once that happens and you have some in and some out, now the percentage is completely thrown off. Because here's what will happen. If you opt out, uh, a person who does this project would still come to me, file the exemption application. They wouldn't be granted for town purposes, but they would be granted for uh, the county and for whatever school district they're in, unless either of those two entities between now and my receiving the application opt out also. So that's what would happen. They wouldn't get the exemption for town. They pay taxes to the town. At the county, 
they would still get the exemption. What would happen after that, I have no idea, because it, again, the way I read the resolution is that the town <coughs> has to administer this. I don't know who, you know, I don't know how the county has authority to tell the town they have to do it. And then, then, then okay, so what is the town? What, you know what I'm saying? Like, who, who within the town does, I mean, what, <laughs> just... Yeah, there's no way to bring it's up the tax dollars. Yeah, it's just, it's ludicrous. But I, I've also heard that Davenport has opted out, somebody said. That's a, I, I don't know. That's what Once you opt out, it has to go on the state's website. Um, and just before I, whatever I do here, um, if you haven't already, there is a very good booklet uh, on NYSERDA's uh, webpage. It's, it's voluminous. And it talks about all the types. It talks about the passive and the active and, and all that. And it talks about the other two systems, too. The, the farm waste and the wind energy. Thank you very much for not asking me any questions about the farm waste tonight. Um, <laughs> but if you go to their site, NYSERDA, it has a very good publication there that talks about all of this stuff. Did you want the lights back? I would. <laughs> 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 